4.40 a.m. there goes the sound of my alarm, so I hit the snooze button for about three times, dragging myself out of bed, half asleep, half a dead, thinking of the eight hours of shit that I've got ahead. <laughs> There's a lot of kids, unfortunate kids, you know, you know, that ain't got a lot of money, and the family don't have a lot of money, so I want to give these kids that step up that I've never had. If it's something you really want to do, yeah, put time and effort into it, and you know, you will definitely get ahead. He's successful like you. Yeah, well, not that successful, I'm still working in the warehouse. I've <laughs> <laughs> been thinking I'm fucking 42, and I've got fuck all, I've got no on. I'll show everybody what I can do this year. If it's not good enough, I'll go back to me. How long do you hold on to your dream for? You know. Come on, everybody. <laughs> can you believe that? That's me, like the star of a film. We've just released a film. I never thought I'd trust anybody enough to do a film about my life. I never thought I'd make a relationship with this award-winning documentary maker. And I never thought the film would like, raise the questions that it did about poverty and working class and things like that. One thing I did know, though, is I had a powerful dream and I belonged to a powerful culture that saved my life. So I'm Steve, also known as Red Eye Phoenix, but for the first 10 years of my life, I was just Steve. Growing up in all was quite difficult until the age of about 12, I just bumbled through life, being pushed around, being bullied, and I kind of accepted that's the way that things was. There was a couple of reasons why I got bullied when I was younger. I had these big stick-out ears that attracted great names like FA Cup, Juggalugs, Dumbo, uh, <laughs> and Wingnut, just to name a few. Uh, the second reason why I got bullied, I was the only kid that used to turn up to junior school where uniform was mandatory, with a note explaining why my uniform wasn't clean or why I was wearing trainers instead of shoes. Because my family didn't have a lot of money, my mum had to save to buy me shoes. So I thought this was cool, that I got to wear trainers, but all the bullies just thought it was more ammunition. My measure of a good day usually was getting through the day with the least amount of punches and insults thrown at me, and that's kind of how I measured my day. I can remember walking to school one day around the age of 10, worrying and thinking what, what the day would bring, dreading it, kind of. And I saw this kid putting down a piece of cardboard on the street, and I just kind of thought, what's he doing? So he, he laid this cardboard out perfectly, and after that, he brought out like a tape deck, put some music on, and what he, what he did next kind of blew my mind. He started spinning on his knees and spinning on his back and everything. And like, I wouldn't want to talk out, really, because of the bullying that I was quite quiet. But something came from me, I just went over to him and said, what are you doing? And he was like, that was called a windmill. Now, the only windmill I knew was a postcard that my nana had sent me from Skidby. And it had a picture on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> again, I repeated to him, like, what are you doing? Now, I believe if that kid had turned around that day and said to me, fuck off and mind your own business, that I wouldn't be stood here telling this story that I'm telling today. But he didn't. He said, that was a windmill. This is a backspin, and he introduced me to hip-hop, the culture that I believe is the greatest culture in the world. I knew I didn't fit in. I knew I was struggling to find something in life where I'd, where I'd fit in. And that day, I knew hip-hop somewhere, somewhere along the line that I'd fit in. I didn't really know where, but I knew that hip-hop opened its door and invited me in. From leaving school, I went straight into work. I wanted to go to college, to better myself, but I didn't really believe in myself enough to do it, so I started working for my dad. This made me realise that even money wasn't important because I didn't have anything growing up. I wanted to break the cycle of just surviving, so I worked hard to put a few quid in my pocket. I think, I think not wanting to struggle for money anymore kind of forced me to make my first mistake in life, and that's putting work before life. I thought that if I had a regular income, life would be better. I modelled this on the notion of having nothing growing up and the constant reminders of the names like Loser, Scruffbag, Tramp, Dosser, names like that from the bullies on a, on a daily basis. 
It took me until now, really, to realise how wrong I was. I'd always dreamt about being a hip-hop artist or a hip-hop MC, but growing older and being a bit wiser, I've now realised that it's not about making money, it's not about selling records, it's about gathering all this knowledge you've, create, you've gained as you've been an artist and then passing it on to the next generation to make a better generation for people to come. Then from my head, the Beats Bus was born. So the Beats Bus is a mobile recording workshop that we created because I was doing a lot of um, workshops in the city centre, but I realised that a lot of families in Hull couldn't afford to give the children money to travel to the city centre all the time. So I thought if we could create this mobile workshop, then we can take the workshops to them and they don't have to travel anywhere. City of Culture 2017. <laughs> <Rah>. <laughs> so my funding, but my funding bid for the Beats bus was turned down at the beginning of the City Culture year. So I started the year with a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. Because I'd read the criteria, I'd read everything, and I was positive that the Beats bus ticked every box that they wanted. So to get told, thank you, but no thank you, we don't believe in this project, kind of made me angry at first. But then it made me look at the city of culture in a different way. Instead of seeing it as this 12-month spectacle, I saw it as an opportunity, you know, a chance to actually get my dream on the road and start, start work with a Beats bus. So I'd had this idea for a while, I knew that all eyes would be on my city in this year, so somehow I had to get the Beats bus out of my head and onto the road. Just before the City of Culture, though, I had a conversation with my friend Rebecca, who had told me that a film director, Sean McAllister, was in Hull, and he was looking for a character to base his film on. Rebecca said that she said to him that he should talk to me, and she, wanted, she, she said that because she thought that my workshops and my music was real interesting, and I had an interesting story to tell. So the first week of City of Culture, there was a great light show called Made in Hull, and it told the story of the history of Hull and a lot of people in Hull, and I went along to it, and I've never seen anything like it in my lifetime, especially in Hull. Like, there, was, there was hundreds and thousands of people stood there watching this light show, and there was crying, there was laughing, there was cheering, and it, it really did bring a, a sense of pride back to the people in Hull, I think. That same night, there was a screening at Fruit. Fruit's like a little venue where I played a, lot, a couple of hip-hop gigs and I really liked the venue. And so I thought, I'll just go along to the screening. I didn't realise that it was Sean there showing his screening of a Syrian love story, the film previous to, to this one. So I kind of like bumbled my way across to him at the bar. I had this little piece of paper with my, my idea on it. And I kind of said to him, look, Sean, this is what I want to do. You know, can I give you my number? Because I was up at six o'clock for my shift the next morning, so I couldn't even stay towards the end of the night. Everybody was wanting to speak to him, so I just kind of like slid in my number and said, like, this is my idea, and kind of left it at that. Um, I didn't really think Sean would get back to me, to be honest, um, but I knew at least I'd made that step and introduced myself, and then the ball was in his court kind of thing. I did get a text the next day, though, saying, I'm away for a couple of weeks, but when I get back, Let's sit down and have a chat and talk about your, your dream and your plans. So, yeah, I received the text. Um, when Sean got back, we met up, we had a coffee, we had a discussion. Um, he kind of said, yeah, I'm interested, in, I'm interested in what you can do. So let's just start filming, you know, and we'll see how it goes from there. And the rest of the say is history. A Northern Soul was born. Um, trusting, trusting Sean and... Having the camera there at first for me was a real big issue because I, I have had quite an issue with trust in my life. People who I've trusted have let me down a lot. So having the camera there at first felt a bit weird and I found myself like watching what I was saying and how I acted because I didn't really know what Sean wanted to show. Also, I couldn't see how my story could be as important as a story like a Syrian love story. I knew I, I had a good idea. I knew that the work we was doing in the community would be great, but I couldn't see how it was important as like surviving a war-torn country. And he spent five years in Syria filming this film. And with me, it was only like a year, so I was a bit, I was a bit skeptic about it. At the same time, though, um, I watched a few of Sean's films, and it made me realise that the characters 
and their family that he, he, he used in the film. He shone a positive light on them and he, he portrayed them in, in a good way. So I watched about three of his documentaries. I watched A Syrian Love Story, A Reluctant Revolutionary, and Japan, A Story of Love and Hate. And at the end of them all, the same message still came, seemed to come through all the time <laughs> that he was, he was trying to shine a nice light on these people and you know, put them in a good place. So that kind of made me lower my guard a little bit. After spending a couple of months with Sean, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a real warm, humble guy and very welcoming, so that kind of made me a bit at ease a bit more. And he's also a real clever director, so he makes you forget that the camera's there, because he does this, the way he shoots films, he like has the camera on his hip and he kind of like <laughs> films you like this, so you kind of forget it's there and... Um, <coughs> So after a couple of months, I made my own opinion of Sean. I realised that, yeah, do you know what? I think I can actually trust this guy. So we then came to agreement that whatever Sean thought was important would film it. So I said, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, I couldn't really measure how I felt about the film. I just thought that putting this film out there will do good for hip-hop and it'll do good for the Beats bus. I never realised all the questions that it would actually raise. Like, it's raised a lot of questions about working class people, about poverty, about class divide, about austerity. I never really thought it, it, any of them questions at all, to be honest. I did trust Sean, though, because all the way through the filmmaking, he was giving me positive advice. He was pushing me to go along to these events that made me feel real uncomfortable. I really didn't want to be there, but he was like, nah, you've got to go, you've got to get yourself out there, you've got to tell people about the Beats bus. So he did help me a lot in a way. All the way through the filming, I didn't really ask Sean what was going to happen with the film until May this year. We'd been filming for about 18 and 19 months. And I said to him, Sean, like, what, what's actually going to happen with the movie? And he said to me, we're premiering it in four weeks at the world's biggest documentary festival in Sheffield. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I shit myself. I really did. I really, really did. I just thought, oh no. But I had, I had grown to trust him enough, you know, to believe that he had my best interests at heart. So the first time I watched the film was on a screen, like stupidly, stupidly big, in Sheffield Documentary Festival. Until I, until I watched it, I didn't, I didn't know all these questions would be asked, like I say, about poverty or struggle. To me, it was just a positive story about the work we was doing with young people and the work we was doing in our community. I didn't know it'd have so many different perspectives and ask so many questions of the working class, which working class people just see as the norm and they just get on with it. The reality of me bringing the Beats bus to life and working full time had a real big detrimental effect on me. So I got divorced, I got demoted, I lost my bonus, I lost my pay rise. I was working an extra 30 hours a week on top of my full-time job. And then at the end of the year, after the end of City of Culture, we got all the equipment taken away from us that we was working with the young people with. So we was, we was left with nothing. And we had all these young people that were so confident and they was wanting to work more and more, but we was left with nothing to do it with. I was pretty devastated, to be honest. I really was. But, you know, I'd grown up in Hull, and I'd seen a lot in my life, and knowing that we was changing the life of young people with the workshops that we was doing kept me going, you know, it, it kept me positive, having the young people around all the time. And I, had, I also had a strong circle of network of supporting my mum, my partner Yaz, you know, my Beats Bus, my Beats Bus tutors are real positive guys. And I also had Sean as well, who kept pushing me constantly, saying, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, when I believed like that I really couldn't and things was getting on top of me. On a positive note though, I've now freed myself for the corporate chains and I'm now manager of Beats Bus Limited. <laughs> um, when we premiered the film in Sheffield, we started a GoFundMe link. And now we've raised enough money with the GoFundMe to buy all the equipment back that we lost. And also, thank you. And also we've paid rent on a little studio, so now the young people that we work with, they've got a base to go work. 
and you know the continuation of the work is there for him. So a lot of projects, our family and city of culture, came into the city, like raised young people's aspirations and beliefs, that was there for a few days and then it was gone. And that just leaves the young people going from here back down to here where it was started. So I think the continuation of projects like that is really important. Um, the impact of the film has been absolutely mental. Um, it's been discussed in the House of Commons. Uh, I believe on the back of that we've got a Parliament screening coming up, so we're going to show the film to all Conservatives <laughs> MPs if we can. Uh, this made me think, like, unless people like Sean and directors like Sean take the time to film people like myself and thousands of other people in the world that's doing things like me, like yourselves, unless directors take time to film people doing that, then our voice stays unheard. Nobody, nobody gets heard. So I, I thank Sean for that. Um, work, yeah, like I say, working class people usually just get on with it. They don't speak out about the difficulties. They don't speak out about the struggles. They just crack on and, you know, just get on with it. So I hope by making this documentary, I can inspire a few people to, like, speak about the struggles they live in. And the more people we get to speak, then, you know, finally, if we keep knocking on doors, maybe someday somebody will listen. So all the money it takes to make these horrible trash TV programmes about people on benefits and scroungers making humans look bad. Take all that money, stop making these horrible TV programmes and give it to community projects and let them work for young people. <laughs> to me, everyone likes to point the blames for society's fuck-ups at the people who suffer from them the most. So to me, the film isn't about poverty, it's not about class, it's not about a fight to change certification because the BBFC gives us a 15. <laughs> it's not about divide, it's not about austerity. The most important message to me is the transformation of the young people that we work with through the film. The community work, thank you. Community work at a young age is so important because if you can give a child belief and confidence, that changes their path in life. And this is something that we've got to do. It also changes the choices and it makes them realise that they have their destiny in their own hands. And this is what we're trying to do with the Beats bus. I truly believe that hip-hop did save my life. And it, made, yeah, it truly made me believe in myself. And I also believe if I was to keep that belief and that hope in, that's where we go wrong in the world. You should share that belief with everybody that you can. So, on the, on the back of that, the film's inspired me to write a five-year plan with my bus. I want to work in every deprived city in the UK if I can, but just to start a five-year plan, which entails five different buses in five different cities doing the same community work that we do. And in the future, I want to roll it out internationally. You know, we've, we've got a lot going on. Um, I believe we're going to Amsterdam to the film festival soon, so we'll be showing them the Beats bus and... Yeah, so that's, that's what we want to do. We just want to make it more powerful. You know, the community work we've been doing has been great. And that brings me back to a northern soul. I am now the star of a film. It's, <laughs> it's a real roller coaster, And I do still find it really hard to watch. I bared my life for the documentary, and when I first watched it, it really saddened me, and I cried all the way through it. <laughs> but now I realise why I'd done it and that was to show the power of the Beats bus and the work we was doing in the community. Since the film, we've won two big contracts in our city, so we've won a contract with Hull City, the football team. So we'll be there with freestyle footballers before the games, teaching the fans to DJ, doing a bit of hip-hop karaoke and stuff like that. Um, we've also won a contract with a place called Goodwin in Hull, so we're doing a project called the Beats Bus Orchestra, so we're combining hip-hop and live music and, you know, orchestra and stuff. I believe this is largely down to Sean and the belief he had in me in the bus. Because, like I say, if he hadn't documented it, then I'd, I wouldn't be telling this story up here. It'd still, I'd still be doing it, but nobody will have heard of it. <coughs> One thing the film did make me realise is, unless we speak about what we're going through, like I say, it does stay unheard. So the more people we get to talk, the louder the voice becomes, and then, like I say, hopefully one day, someone will take notice. 
Um, the message I want you all to go where we're from today is community work is so important, groundwork is so important. If we don't help the young people get through the struggle and, you know, the horrible world it is today, if somebody doesn't guide the young people through that, then they're going to end up a statistic and they're going to end up not being who they should be. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.